Welcome to the Midweek Show. This is the bonus episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. Uh, Happens when I have time. (laughs) When I have time to actually create another show. You know, I have the show uh, Love and Abuse. That's another podcast I do for difficult relationships and emotional abuse and control and manipulation. So that takes up some time. I I also have the weekend show, The Overwhelmed Brain. So that takes up a lot of time. And um, because I get a lot of emails and a lot of messages and I have a lot sitting in my queue... I uh, have to make other shows, and this is one of those shows. So if you've never heard the bonus show, this this is what it's all about. Uh, but definitely tune into the weekend show, the Sunday edition of The Overwhelmed Brain, if you want to hear the fully produced version of T.O.B. <laughs> for those of you new to the show, thank you for showing up. This is actually a personal growth and development show. I talk about personal empowerment and honoring your values and showing up authentically and really just creating the life you want by making the right decisions. And uh, how do you make the right decisions? Well, I talk about that in another show too. (laughs) I talk about it on episodes like this. And I hope that you leave every episode making the right decision, uh, especially the ones that work for you and serve you and serve others that you love. In fact, we'll be talking about that a little bit, serving others that you love in this episode. But before I begin, I want to mention that Neurohacker is the sponsor for this episode. I have been taking the supplement called Qualia Mind by Neurohacker. And I got to tell you, I am digging it. I am loving it. I am telling you about it because I want you to know about it. If you're looking for something to beat brain fog and amplify your willpower and really heighten your creativity and hopefully do the same things for you that it's been doing for me, uh, especially getting off my butt and creating two or three shows a week. (laughs) I mean, there was one day that I actually created two shows in one day, and that's rare for me. It was unusual. So I'm telling you about Neurohacker. I'll talk about them a little later, but I want you to head over to neurohacker.com. That's N-E-U-R-O, hacker.com. I'm on the uh, caffeine-free version of Qualia Mind, and I am totally loving it. So thank you, Neurohacker, for sponsoring this episode. And Make sure to use the promo code TOB to get 15% off your order. Let's get right into it. So uh, I've got an email here that I'm just going to read through. And I told you that I'll probably talk about serving others that you love. And I'm not going to get into that so much, although it has a hint of that, as you'll hear me talk about in a little bit. But um, this person wrote, I'm just going to comment on the email as I read it. The person wrote, hey, I just turned 19 years old. And I've recently been having a bit of an existential crisis that has been building up since I left religion a few years ago. I know I should feel liberated by this, but instead I can't help but feel lost and unmotivated and purposeless. No one meaning of life. And you just have to do whatever you find meaningful and fulfilling to you. Another part of my crisis is that I have realized that I have never really had a strong sense of self which I'm sure is a reason why I'm feeling so unmotivated. I can't seem to find good enough reasons to motivate myself if nothing matters in the end. Okay, so there's more to this email, and I'm going to read that. But I want to comment on this. Uh, A couple things that he said. I do have an episode on finding joy in life and finding meaning in life. Uh, Let me look that up. I'll tell you what it's called. You can go to the overwhelmed brain and in the search field, I want you to look for this. There's an article I wrote, actually a couple of things. There's an article I wrote called, What's the Point of Life Without Joy and Happiness? Look for that article. In fact, in the search field at theoverwhelmedbrain.com, you can just type in the word joy and you'll, you'll see it come up. There's another one I'm going to give you. It's called Finding Your True Path So You Don't End Up Living a False Life. I did that back in 2018, and um, that might help too. So if you go to my website, theoverwhelmedbrain.com, look for the word joy, and you can even type in the word life when I talk about life things. There's a life decision. There's a life path. There's a life journey. All the things I talk about there. You also may want to type in the word purpose in the search field, and I do have like the last segment of an episode I did in 2017. I call it Finding Purpose, so you'll... You'll see the entire name of the episode, which is when it's time to call it quits in a relationship, uh, weaning family off of you and finding purpose. So there's quite a few things that I talk about that if you ever send me a question, you might want to look on my website in the search field to find out if I've already talked about it because it can be helpful. So uh, there's the first part of my answer. 
uh, regarding, you know, looking for your meaning of life. Now, I haven't uh, touched upon this in a long time. You know, what is the meaning of life? Or I can't find meaning in my life. Or I don't feel like there's purpose in my life. And what this person is saying is that since I left religion a few years ago, I see that there is no one meaning of life. So this is how I approach the meaning of life. I believe, and and this is maybe not a popular opinion, or maybe it is, but it may not resonate with you or not, but I look at meaning as the search for meaning. (laughs) So what does that mean? It means that my meaning is defined in the search. You know, you might want to look at it as the journey is the meaning, but I look at it as the search. So as as long as, as there's a search and a curiosity for what the heck we're all doing here, you know, what is the purpose of my life? What is the meaning of my life? I'm always on the search for that. Because I think once we find it, we're done. <laughs> I mean, it sounds ominous there, but I think once we've found our meaning or our purpose, then we've probably fulfilled it. Now, that's sort of a dismal attitude, actually, because somebody might think, well, I thought I found my purpose. Are you saying that I haven't found my purpose yet? Or my meaning is here in this uh, thing that I do or this work that I do or my children. I have all this meaning in my life. Are you saying that there's more? No, I'm saying that if you're looking for meaning, if you don't think there's much meaning in your life or you don't feel like there's any purpose in your life, that perhaps maybe my philosophy is that you're always on the search for meaning and that finding it is when you're done. And what does that mean? That could mean the end of your life or that could mean the beginning of your life. Because once you're done searching for meaning, then you're not searching for it anymore. That question isn't in there. That uh, curiosity or that existential crisis like this person's talking about. Sometimes you are always on the search for meaning. So, you know, that's my personal opinion. And this is definitely more of an internal, maybe spiritual perspective. Uh, It's definitely a deeper concept. It's not so much a practical thing like breathe and count to 10 and then meditate. I think meaning and purpose in life is something that you discover along the path searching for meaning and purpose in life. And that search it might be something that lasts for a long time. So if you, in this person's case, if you've had religion in the past, then your meaning and purpose might be to serve God or serve a higher power, serve some spiritual uh, fulfillment of some sort. You're, You're on a path, you're on a journey in that respect. And it can be very structured when you look at it that way. It's kind of nice. Some people need structure. You might need structure. I think it's helpful to have structure. So when you have structure, you have a path and you know what the path is and you know what you have to do and you know you have to follow the path and sometimes you fall off the path and then you're forgiven and you're back on the path and now you're going on the path again and you realize, oh, this is the path I need to be on, so on and so on. So I I believe that when people have structure, they have more meaning and more purpose in their life and they're able to follow the path because it has been laid out before them or they know the path through other teachings or whatever. And uh, it just feels purposeful. But not everyone has that. Some people don't have that structure. Some people are kind of lost, like, wow, without this structure, what do I do now? So this gets into the second part of my answer to this part of the email is I like to look at a purpose in life not being about me at all. Sometimes you have to get into that space that this place is not really about you. And I don't mean to say that, you know, stop thinking of yourself, you're being egoistic. And I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that when you feel like you don't have meaning or you're looking for meaning or looking for purpose, it feels like it should be a solo endeavor about yourself. Like you should climb the mountain and meditate in a cave and everything will be great because now you're going inward. You know, some people can do that and find ultimate meaning. Some people can do that and have a a spiritual connection with themselves so deep and so great that they feel connected to the world. That inner search, that inner journey 
connects them to the outer world. And some people need to do it in reverse. Some people need to go into the outer world and find meaning, and this is where I'm going, find meaning by making it about others instead of themselves. And so what does that mean? And I'm going to give you a personal story for this. And this is something new I've just been thinking of in the past few months. As my needs are met, let's just say that all my needs are met. I have all my basics taken care of. I have all the foundational things I need in my life. And I don't really need too much more. There's plenty I want. But wants, you know, you get it. And now what? You, you want something else. Okay, then you get that. Now, now what? You want something else. When you need something, you're so grateful <laughs> to have that need. You're so grateful to have food. You're so grateful to have a shower or a home that when you get this stuff, you can get used to it and realize, oh, I'll always have a home and I'll always have food. And you can get accustomed to it. You can get used to it and you don't really think about it. So uh, having food every day might not be such a drive or much meaning in your life. But for some people, trying to make enough money to get food every day uh, could be something that drives them, could be like a purpose in their life. Now, that does sound like it's more surviving than thriving, but I do believe there's a level you get to where you're not so much surviving anymore. And when you get past that level where you don't always have to try to survive every day and now your needs are met and you're getting just beyond the surviving so that you can actually fulfill some wants in your life. Now it becomes less about you. I mean, this is again, if you are searching for meaning and purpose, uh, if you are not fulfilled in the meaning and purpose area of your life, then it, you might want to think that maybe this isn't about me at all. Maybe it's about something else. And coming back to my personal story. So uh, I believe that my needs are met. I have my needs met. Of course, there's more that I want and there's more that I need. But my basics, you know, all my foundational stuff is met, which has not too long ago made me question why I do what I do and continue doing what I do. And I think this question came from my girlfriend. I, should, I think she said, what keeps driving you to sit at that desk every day and create all that content that you create and putting out this uh, multiple free podcasts and all this information out there into the world? And I thought about it for like 30 seconds. I don't even know, 15 seconds. It didn't take long. I, it came to me fast. The thought that came to me was twofold. One, my immediate answer was, because I would rather see you out in the garden doing whatever you want to do all day because I make enough money for both of us. That's what I want to see. And, you know, it touched her. She was, she was so uh, happy to hear that because it wasn't about me wanting a bigger car or a bigger house or anything like that. It was about her and wanting to make the best life I can for her. If I can make the best life possible for her where she doesn't have to work her butt off every day doing what she does and, you know, we can bring in enough income and have enough of our needs met where she doesn't have to work as well, then that makes me feel so good. And that is part of what I do that brings me meaning in life is serving her, is trying to make her life easier. And when I think about that, it makes me feel so good. And so again, she was touched and, you know, I'm not saying this to tell you I'm a great guy or anything. It just makes me feel so warm and good inside thinking that I could do that for her. And that totally motivates me to do more, to do better, to continue along this journey. Because there's a point in your own work and career that you're going to get everything done and you're going to have what you want and you need. But when that's all fulfilled, who else is going to benefit from that? Are you going to be alone and enjoy it by yourself? Now, that doesn't mean you have to have a romantic relationship. And this is the second part of my answer to her. I said, I also want to take care of my mom. I want to take care of my family. You know, my family is a thousand miles from here. And I think, wow, you know, if I had all the funds, all the resources in the world, and I could take care of them so that they didn't have to work so hard, they didn't have to worry about bills, they didn't have to worry about anything, that would make me feel so enriched and so alive. So this is what I'm saying is that sometimes the pursuit of meaning and purpose 
isn't about you. Now, what happens is the effect of serving others in this way, and this is what I was talking about at the very beginning of the show, how do you serve others you love? I think this is a great way to do it. It may not be for everyone. Some people want to keep it to themselves. I'm not here to judge, but I think that when you get into a space where you have enough to offer others and you can help them, then it makes you feel good as a side effect. To me, it's so pleasing to see someone's face light up when you're able to do something for them that they couldn't do for themselves or was very difficult for them to do for themselves. It doesn't even have to be about money. It can be like that time I pulled over and I helped this really old guy with all these young kids change his tire. And This guy had this nice button-up shirt, and he was trying to move the crossbar, trying to loosen the lug nuts, and I just pulled up behind him. He didn't even know I was there, and I just walked up to him. Again, he didn't see me, didn't hear me, but I walked up to him, and I tapped him on the shoulder, and I, I didn't say a word, and I just took over, and he stood back, and I changed his tire for him, and the look on his face, he was so grateful, and it just made me feel so good. It felt so good. You know, I could look at that as an inconvenience, like, oh, I got to stop and get all greasy and I got to change a tire. And I could look at it that way, which is a very self-centered thing to do. Um, And maybe I did feel that way. Like, oh, I know this is going to be inconvenient. But after I was done, that thought never crossed my mind. In fact, I was more fulfilled from that one little thing. And it still fulfills me knowing that I did that for someone else. So this is all to that point of, looking for meaning, looking for purpose, that it's sometimes not about you. It's sometimes about others. It's sometimes about, it doesn't even have to be human beings. If you want to do it for animals or plants or trees, I mean, you might have other things that give you purpose and meaning in your life, but how can you expand beyond yourself? Because maybe you're no longer in survival mode, or maybe you are but it's still not giving you any type of meaning. I mean, survival mode is not something that I would say is meaningful, but um, typically when you're too busy trying to take care of yourself, it's very hard to go outside yourself and help others. That's where the challenge comes in. It obviously can be done, but it's a little harder to enjoy that or have purpose in that when you're still trying to take care of yourself. Which brings us Let's go to the next section of your email regarding what you asked, which is another part of your crisis that is that you never had a strong sense of self. And he said, I'm sure it's a reason why I'm feeling so unmotivated. I can't seem to find good reasons to motivate myself if nothing matters in the end. So here's what I look at. When nothing matters, then I like to have the attitude of, well, what do I got to lose then? I'm going to do this thing or say these words What do I got to lose? Sometimes we put ourselves in a corner by not speaking up or not telling others what's acceptable and what's not, you know, our boundaries. Sometimes we make ourselves kind of invisible. Like, I better not say anything. I better not do this because somebody might get mad, even though we want to, even though we would rather say something. I mean, look at everyone out there right now protesting, you know, this George Floyd stuff and how many people are just putting themselves out there, taking a stand, saying, this is wrong. This has to stop. That is meaningful. That is purposeful. They have had enough. And they are now saying, you know what? We have to establish boundaries. We have to establish guidelines. We have to establish new laws. We have to train people. We have to do a lot of stuff. And is this about the individual protesting? Yes. And it's about others. So you have not only yourself, but others. This is the me and others kind of model. But if you look at the others they're protesting about, the ones they're trying to protect, you know, they want everyone to know that black lives matter and stop killing them. That protest, that cause that most of us are fighting for right now is bigger than us. It is something that is a very difficult hurdle to jump over which is why it's been going on for days and days and days because they are trying to make a change, which is why it's meaningful. This is something that religion does too, and I'm I'm definitely not comparing religion with what's going on today, but uh, if you look at religion as a structure, as a path, 
that's how I compare this, is that this protesting is a path. It's a journey to accomplish something powerful, to accomplish something meaningful. And so you look at religion, it, it does a similar thing. It, it's a path, a structure with a path that helps somebody accomplish something, be a good person, end up in heaven, or whatever your beliefs are. And so that's another way to bring purpose and meaning into your life is to be affected by something so strongly that you just have to change it. You just have to go out there and help make the change or help facilitate the change or like Gandhi said, be the change. You know, do the things that you want to see done in the world. Be the things that you want to see happen in the world. So this is another way to look at having something bigger than yourself can be a way to motivate you into finding purpose and finding meaning. And this is, again, also about boundaries. You know, I come back to the self again, and I define boundaries as telling people what you will and won't accept. And if you've been too quiet about that, about telling people what they're doing against you that you don't like, how they're disrespecting you, uh, that you won't accept certain behaviors, if you're not saying anything about that, and that causes people to keep doing it, making you smaller. This is what happens is that when we're quiet, when we don't tell people that they're doing something that we don't like and they're doing things that we don't accept, it makes us small and quiet and in the background and meaningless. It feels unimportant. It feels insignificant. And we just don't feel like we have a voice. And you can hear my voice starting to lower as I talk like that because I'm trying this on. I feel so small. I feel so meaningless. I feel so tiny in this giant world and I can't make a change. I'm not even making changes for myself. This is why I highly encourage boundaries is you start telling people what is acceptable and what is not. If you don't honor your boundaries, you will have a very difficult time feeling like there's any structure in your life at all. Boundaries are your structure. If you don't like something, you say, I'm sorry, I don't like that. But if you're the type of person that says, well, you know, I, I don't know if I like that or not then you're not really defining a boundary. You're not really defining any type of structure in your life. What you're really doing is you're being very ambiguous, you're being very vague, and you're not letting the world know who you are. Boundaries are so vital to creating structure and even expanding that, because with structure, expanding that into purpose and meaning. Because I tell you what, once you create boundaries in your life, and you honor those boundaries, and you don't allow other people to dishonor your boundaries, you take life to a whole new level. You find meaning. You find purpose because you feel pretty darn good being you. And this is where you start to get your sense of self. As you start doing what you want to do in your life, you start being who you want to be in your life. And, you know, this person who wrote said he just turned 19. 19 is, you know, you're still down there. <laughs> you're still at that age where you're going to go through some changes. And back then, 19, I was like 16 at 19. I was young. I was immature. And maybe you're a lot more mature than I was. But at that age, you're still learning about life. You're still trying to experience life. And, you know, maybe you have restrictive parents and, you know, you said you have a religious background. So maybe they're religious and you feel like they're holding you back or maybe their teachings are holding you back or something else. I mean, you weren't too descriptive about what you said, so I'm just making guesses. But if you feel restricted, if you feel like you really can't speak up and speak your mind and maybe you're still living at home, well, A, wait till you leave. Because once you leave home, you're going to make all your own decisions. You're going to be doing your own thing, and it's going to be a lot different. But if you have left home, then remember that now you're an adult. I mean, if you don't feel like an adult, you are turning into an adult, and you are making your own decisions. And yes, you might have to say, you know what, Mom? You know what, Dad? I know you want me to do that, but I'm not going to. I know you want me to follow this path, but I've chosen my own path, and I know it disappoints you. 
but I want to ask you this, do you want me to be happy? And they may say, of course, we want you to be happy as long as you follow the word of God and blah, blah, blah. They might say this stuff, and I'm not trying to minimize that. If you have beliefs that follow that and you're not feeling weighed down by those beliefs, uh, as long as they serve you, absolutely do anything that serves you. But in this person's case, what's happening in his life isn't serving him. So this is another thing I want you to do is start writing down the things that don't serve you. You know, that's a kind of a loaded word, what serves me, what doesn't serve me. But what makes you feel good and what makes you feel bad? What serves you and what doesn't? If you got out of a religious background and you are still being pushed in a religious way, that may not serve you at this time. Who knows? In 10 years, you could go back to church and feel a whole different way, or maybe you'll never go back. Maybe you'll find another path. Maybe you'll find another religion. Maybe you'll find a spiritual path. Maybe you'll become an atheist. No matter what, it's your path. Your religious path is always your own. It is always defined by you. This may be controversial, but I'm going to say it. Your path is always defined by you because traveling the path helps you find the path. Looking for purpose helps you find the purpose. Looking for meaning helps you find meaning. And if you get out of a certain way of believing or thinking and get into another way of believing or thinking and you just follow that path for a while, it's either going to resonate with you or not. And, you know, religion is a very personal thing. Spirituality is a very personal thing. And maybe you just have to keep that to yourself. Maybe you have to get that to yourself unless you are with others that are like-minded. And then, of course, open up. And at the same time, you can always open up about who you are as long as you don't mind owning it. And that's another point I want to make. You have to own who you are. This is the opposite of being quiet. This is the opposite of being small or insignificant. Own who you are. If you're a God-fearing Christian, then by gosh, own it. Wear your cross. Go to church every Sunday. Absolutely own it. If you are a spiritual yogi and you do transcendental meditation every day, then own that. This is what I do. What? You don't have a job? No. <laughs> I don't have a job. I'm a yogi and I love it. I'm not saying all yogis don't have jobs. I'm just saying you could be anything you want as long as you feel good being that, as long as you get your needs met and it's serving you, making you a better person, a more improved version of yourself what more could the world ask for than the best version of you? I think that's a great perspective to have. You know what? You want the happiest version of me? I mean, let's just say that this kid is talking to his uh, mom and dad. You want the best version of me? Then I'm going to follow this path because that's going to make me the happiest, most fulfilled version. And even if I take the wrong path, I need to fall. You know that song, let me fall. I need to fall. You need to let me fall. You need to let me learn this because if you stuff it down my throat, I'm going to rebel. <laughs> I'm going to follow a path that I may not like or I hate, and then I'm going to feel like everything taught on that path is wrong because you forced it on me. So I'm going to follow an entirely different path, and maybe some of that stuff was good, but I'll never look at it again because you forced it down my throat. And that person who felt so restricted and so forced to do something that they didn't want to do never learned on their own. And this is what self-empowerment is all about. You follow your path. You learn on your own or with others. Totally up to you. But you learn through your own process. And then when you fall down or when you find something out that you don't like and you go, oh, crap, I'm on the wrong path. Now you get back up and go, okay, I'm going to dust myself off. I'm going to review all these paths. I'm going to review all these options and then make a decision on which path I want to follow. I've done this several times in my life. I've followed one path and then another path and then another path. And now I feel good on the path I'm on. But that could change. That could change in 10 years. I don't believe in making a path permanent and forever. I believe in making the path flexible. I believe that the path has many winds and twists and forks, and sometimes you have to take a left, and sometimes you have to take a right, and sometimes you have to stop and sit there for 10 years before the next path opens up, and that's just the way it is. And again, this is what works for me. This is my belief system. This is my journey. It may not work for you. Sometimes you have a fixed path, and it's working great, 
definitely keep on it. But the person who wrote to me, this is what I'm answering is looking for meaning, looking for purpose. So I hope that helped with the first part of your email. I'm actually going to go into the second part of your email right after this. I'm going to tell you about Neurohacker. And Neurohacker is a supplement that I've been taking for the last three months. And um, I got to tell you, there's some things happening <laughs> in the sense that I'm not too sure how to define it except to tell you one thing that has happened that I noticed is that I'm having desires to finish things and fine tune things. Like, for example, I play classical guitar as a hobby and um, I have been playing the same songs for like 20 years now. In fact, I started in 1999. So 20 years, I've been playing the same songs. And once I learn it well enough, I feel like, okay, I'm just going to stumble through this and get through it because I like playing. But for some reason, well, I know the reason, I'm on the Qualia Mind supplement. Um, I'm starting to break down these songs and find the problem areas and correct them. Because I'll stumble through a part and then I'll just be happy that I stumbled through it. But I'll never stop and fix it because I'm always ready to play the rest of the song. And ever since I started taking this supplement, I've started breaking it down and learning the parts and slowing it down and just thinking more clearly and creatively and learning the process of getting it right. So this is one of the many changes that seem minute, but they're actually huge improvements to my life because what it's doing is it's helping me fine tune the way I think and the way I create and the way I work. And it feels like it's allowing me to access parts of my brain that I didn't have access to before. I mean, it just seems to be facilitating it and making it happen. So I'm only sharing with you my experience because I'd love to hear your experience taking this supplement as well. It's called Qualia Mind. It's at neurohacker.com, N-E-U-R-O, and the word hacker.com. It's designed to help your memory and give you premium cognitive support and to really improve your mental performance and brain health. It's for brain fog, it's for willpower, it fuels your focus and concentration. It decreases procrastination. I mean, I can't tell you how many projects that I've started but not continued. And ever since I started taking Qualia Mind, I find myself doing these things that I just haven't done in almost a year. So I really feel like it is heightening a lot of my energy levels and, and creativity. So. I'm sharing this with you because if it's something that sounds like you might need, then this is the best I've seen yet. So head over to neurohacker.com and make sure to use the promo code TOB, like the overwhelmed brain, TOB as your promo code to get 15% off on top of the 50% off your first month by subscribing to the supplement. I've said it before, I, I rarely ever talk about supplements on the show unless I'm doing it myself, unless I believe in it. And I'm finding benefits with it. And there's a lot more I want to tell you, but I'll save that for future episodes. I want you to check it out at neurohacker.com. And on their site, they're fully transparent. They'll tell you exactly what their ingredients are. And there's no proprietary blend. So check them out, neurohacker.com. Use the promo code TOB for 15% off on top of 50% off the first month. Welcome back. Like I said, I'm going to go into the second part of this email right now. I'm just going to continue reading what he said, and let's see where we go with it. Uh, what does he say? He says, I also have a question about something you talked about in an episode that kind of relates to what I was talking about before. I think you said at one point in your life you were living on the streets with no ego, kind of like Eckhart Tolle did for a while. And then you went to where you are now, having built a successful business for yourself and build up your ego again. During that period on the streets, I'm sure you learned to find joy in the present moment and you knew you didn't need anything else to be happy. Uh, what I struggle with is I have read about detaching yourself from your ego and I feel like it's possible to find the bliss without any amount of money or status. What is the point in trying to get those things? Why not just sit in the woods and meditate all day long? After experiencing that, what drove you and is driving you today to set goals and keep doing what you're doing? Is it the happiness you find in going toward reaching your goals? I really appreciate the content you're putting out. It's way more helpful to me than any other self-help content that I have consumed. I would be so happy to hear back from you, and I hope what I'm telling you and asking you about makes sense. Thank you so much for your words, and thank you for sharing all this. That was the end of the email. And let me make a few comments here. Uh, a... 
I never lived on the streets. I was broke. I had no money. Uh, I was married at the same time, and we both had no money. We were going to the soup kitchen every single morning. This is when I was in California. And uh, we did that for several, two or three, maybe four months. And um, we got boxes of food. I mean, we had no money. We were lucky to live with my wife's mom in her 600-square-foot apartment, very tiny place. Um, so I did have a shower. I did have a place to sleep. Never lived on the streets directly. Closest I ever got, though. I mean, that was the closest I ever got to living on the streets. Now, during that time, being broke, there was a sense of joy I had that I couldn't really uh, hit any lower as far as like having no money and very close to being on the streets. I probably, yeah, that would have been lower. But at that time, it felt like the lowest, it was the lowest both of us had ever been. And it was the lowest I've ever been in my life. And that did feel like as close to the lowest point uh, I've ever gotten. So yes, at that time, even though it was our lowest point, there was joy, and the joy did come. Maybe joy is the wrong word. Maybe um, peace it was probably a better word. There was peace in being broke because, A, I had no bills. <laughs> so I really didn't have to worry about the next bill coming in. Uh, B, what I feared most was already behind me, and that was getting broke. I talk about that in the anxiety episodes I do, is that we have this anxiety that we're going to be broke or we're going to look like an idiot or this anxiety keeps building for something that we fear. But when the fear actually comes true, when the event that we are, we're afraid of actually comes true, suddenly the anxiety goes away because it's already there and it's already in the past. So this is what happened. I mean, I know I'm kind of simplifying it here, but this is what happened to me is that when what I feared coming true, which is losing all my money, getting broke, having no place else to live. I mean, we lost our condo at the time too. So um, we basically had really nothing to our name. We did have our uh, her car, but that was it. And the fear of losing everything really came true. I mean, this was, I think, before I broke down in the desert that day. I have another story about that and about letting go of attachments. But at this time, we were losing all of our money and the anxiety around losing money and seeing your bank account go down and down and down to the point where you finally have nothing. The anxiety builds up, builds up, and the panic can build up and it can be so frightening. And then you have nothing. And then what else is there to be afraid of? At least as far as money, because there's no more money to worry about not having. So again, I know I'm simplifying it, but when it happened to me, and this may not be the same story for everyone, but when it happened to me, the anxiety went away. The fear went away because I wasn't afraid of losing what I didn't have anymore. I wasn't afraid of losing something I didn't own. It's hard to be afraid of losing anything when you have nothing to lose. So when I say I felt peace, it was peaceful was very peaceful not having to worry about losing any more money because there was nowhere else to go. Once you hit bottom, it's kind of the breakdown before the breakthrough. And the breakthrough doesn't have to happen right away. It's just that the bottom is usually your biggest fear. But once the biggest fear comes true, the fear kind of dissipates. I mean, you might develop a new fear like, oh no, like we thought, what are we going to eat? But even that fear was squashed pretty quickly when we realized, oh, we just have to get up really early and stand in line at the soup kitchen. And that's what we did. And it was a, a challenging time of our lives and also a time when the fear of losing everything was basically coming true. Again, we had a place to live. So I can't even share from a perspective that, you know, we were on the streets and we were starving. That's a whole nother level that other people have experienced way beyond what we did. But all I can tell you is what I experienced. And having your biggest fear come true stops the fear because there's nothing to be afraid of after it happened. It, you know, again, simplified and it's not the same for everyone, but I've experienced this at least two or three times in my life. And, you know, I mentioned the desert. I broke down in the Arizona desert once and lost 
my car and I lost all my stuff in my car. I had a lot of stuff in my car because we had just moved. And I had to come to a huge decision of letting go of all my attachments and huge, huge panic attack back then. But once I realized I had no choice but to let everything go, the acceptance flowed through me and the fear of losing everything was gone because everything was already gone. So again, another show. Uh, in fact, I think it's called Letting Go of Attachments. So if you go to theoveroneandbrain.com, you can look up Letting Go of Attachments. It's a two-part episode. I talk about that. But it's an entirely different experience when what you fear comes true because all your fear can go away, at least regarding the event that you're fearing. There can be other fears that pop up, and you might have to reach threshold with those too. But I share this with you because, yes, if we're going to look at any joy or peace I felt back then, it was because of that. It was because everything that I feared coming true did come true. And then, of course, there's nothing else to fear. You know, there's always things to fear, I guess. But uh, the biggest fears were gone. The anxiety about not having money, gone, because I didn't have any money. (laughs) So I wasn't afraid of losing something I didn't have. So let me go on to the next part of your email, which says... um, building up my ego after building a successful business and things like that. Yes, after being at the soup kitchen three or four months, you know, I'm applying for jobs. I'm trying to find work. This is around 2009, I think. And uh, this is when I think the economy was going south, the mortgage crisis. So a lot of people were experiencing, you know, similar things. So I'm looking for work and um, a headhunter, uh, you know, a temp agency found me work. And I thought, oh, great, I have work. There's going to be money in our lives again. This is great. And so, yes, I ended up going back to work. And another whole story I won't get into, but I quit that job and got another job and it paid me well. And that was what really got us back on our feet. But your question is regarding the ego. So let me address that. When we were broke, I wouldn't say I was detached from my ego. I would just say it wasn't creating the fear that it used to create. You know, I, I kind of look at ego and fear as in the same category sometimes, or at least fear stems from the ego, because what am I afraid of? Well, I'm afraid of going hungry. Well, why am I afraid of going hungry? Because I might die if I go hungry. Well, why am I afraid of dying? You know, there's egoistic and philosophical and spiritual questions in there. And um, looking at who I was back then, I wouldn't say the ego had too much involved with that except the fear of losing money so you know my ego is attached to having money my ego is attached to believing that money is the only way to survive so I had some work to do there but I wasn't detached from it I still had an ego and I still have an ego and I don't think I've ever detached from my ego and I don't think I ever will I believe in a healthy ego. I believe that an ego can be something that motivates you, that gets you out of bed in the morning, that causes you to fight for your rights, that causes you to honor yourself and honor your boundaries. I believe the ego has a lot of function. And detaching from it, some people can do it. I can't. So I'm not able to talk to you from a total detachment of ego. I think ego is a great, great tool, just like anything. Anger is a great tool. Sadness is a great tool. All these things are great tools, even though they might have a negative connotation, but you have to use them in a beneficial way. For ego, I used my ego to get out of low self-esteem and low self-worth and, you know, feeling uh, self-conscious. And there's a lot of things I use my ego to do to help me improve myself to strengthen all these uh, weaknesses inside of me and when I got to a point where I felt good in myself then I didn't have to rely on the ego so much it reached a peak that I was comfortable with where I didn't want to turn into arrogant or selfish or snobby or anything like that I just I had to make sure it didn't go past you know I didn't want to be a know-it-all I didn't want to be called a, a guru I didn't want to feel like I was superior to anyone so I made sure to keep my ego in check so Regarding the question about detaching from the ego and feeling, like you said, bliss without any money or status, uh, you said, what is the point of trying to get those things? Why not just sit in the woods and meditate all day? Because in my belief, money is important. Money is the system that we created many, many years ago in order to trade for goods, trade for services. So I've decided in my life that money is important. And I love money. I love being able to make money. I love having enough money so I have enough options. But again, 
Is it all for serving me? And this is where I would tell ego to take a back seat. Because let's just say that I did this for my girlfriend. Let's just say I did this for my family. I think about my mom and how she could use a monthly stipend. <laughs> I called that a stipend once. And my mom was always asking me, where's my stipend? She's joking. But <laughs> I would love to be able to send her a monthly stipend, something that just takes care of all her bills. That's what I want to do. I want to do that for her and her new boyfriend. <laughs> She's, I don't want her to have to run into money issues. I want to take care of that so she can live her life beyond the fears and the worries of money. So I make money important to me so I can use it for me and others. And this is one of those self and others pursuits that I have in my life is that I want to make enough money for me and enough money for the other people that I can benefit. And so why I don't sit and meditate in the woods all day is because I want my mom to live the life I want her to live. I want her to live a much better worry-free life. And I won't be able to reach that goal ever probably, but at least I can make it a bit easier. Why I don't meditate in the woods all day, I want my girlfriend to have an amazing life. I want her to be able to relax and do the things that she wants to do without having to work every day and you know, worry about work and think about work. And, you know, it's a lifelong pursuit. I don't know if I'll ever reach it, but maybe I will. Maybe I'll reach a point where I don't have to worry about money myself. And because I'm not worrying about it, I can help the people I love. So again, this may not be your pursuit, but this is what drove me and what drives me today to set my goals and keep doing what I'm doing. And on top of this, and I forgot to even mention this, is that I am actually so grateful when people write to me and say, you changed my life, you saved my marriage, or you saved me from my marriage, or you taught me so much that I was able to do this and my life is better. Or like this young kid that wrote me once and he said, you know, I have this uh, skin problem and I don't want to show anyone. My whole class is going on this field trip or we're going to go to the beach and I've decided I'm not going to go because I'm so self-conscious about my skin problem. So I, I just felt so bad for the kid and I wanted him to experience life and not have this one thing hold him back. Because if he doesn't beat this, he's going to be like, like I was as a kid. I never wanted to take my shirt off at the pool. And so I shared in one episode what I was self-conscious of. I said, you know what? I've never told this to anyone. And I shared what I was self-conscious of. And I said, you know, your true friends are going to love you no matter who you are, no matter what you look like. And why would you want to live in fear that someone's going to judge you? I mean, the people that judge you aren't going to be your friends. The people that judge you are going to be those other people that you don't want to hang out with anyway. So why not go on this trip, enjoy yourself, have a good time, and anyone that judges you, they're going to be crossed off your friends list. And everyone else that doesn't say anything or maybe mentions it or asks you about it but never says a word after that and you still get along and everything is wonderful, they're going to continue being your friends and there's going to be no problem. But don't live your life constantly worrying about your body and your image because you think other people are going to judge you. The judging people aren't your friends. They aren't going to be the ones that you're hanging out with anyway. So I said that in the episode, and I don't know how long, maybe a few weeks or a few months later, he said, you know what? I took your advice. I'm so glad I went. I had the best time. And when I read this email, I started tearing up because this kid's life changed. And all because somebody said something that motivated him or made him feel good or made him think differently. And my heart felt so full. I never met the kid. I've never met most of the people that listen to this show. Yet, if I can tell you something that makes such a difference that your life actually pivots into a new direction, that makes you feel better, that gets the toxic people out of your life or gives you the confidence to face toxic people and stand up for yourself and stand up for what you believe in, that's worth more than any amount of money that I can ever imagine. And it makes me feel so good. It's very fulfilling. And things like that, when they happen to me, when I talk about this stuff on the air and people write to me and say, oh my God, my life has changed or this huge thing happened thanks to you. Not only do I feel good, but yes, it helps with my ego. <laughs> it does. It fills my ego, but in a healthy way. And if my ego is filled in this healthy way because I'm serving others in this way, then why not fill the ego 
with something that motivates you to do it again and again and again. And I've been doing this for seven years. I've been putting this information out there. Everything I learn, everything I know, everything I've gone through in my own life, I share as much as possible. I give it all away for free. And of course, I have products that I sell. And some people buy those products. And some people only listen to this show or Love and Abuse, the other show. And my goal is just to put the information out there to make a better world, which my ego wants because I want to be in a wonderful place that other people are improving themselves, working on themselves, working on their toxic behaviors or gaining the confidence to deal with people with toxic behaviors or just getting rid of the toxic people in their lives and working on their boundaries and showing up more authentically. All of these traits that I would love to see in this world, and I imagine you would too, so that when you go out and connect with people after this COVID stuff is over and we're connecting again, if everyone is on a path of self-improvement of some sort of trying to be the best version of themselves as they can, what more could you ask for? You want to be around people. You love to be around people. People aren't judging you or being critical or putting you down or just being hard to deal with. They're actually self-aware, they're conscientious, and they have empathy and they care. This is the kind of world I want to see. This is the kind of world that I want to live in, which is why I keep doing this. And I kind of veered off talking about myself here. But I'm <laughs> telling you this because you asked me about um, what causes me to continue doing what I'm doing toward my goals, all of the above, all of the above. And yes, it's not just about me. If it was just about me, I wouldn't be on the air talking about this stuff. I want to make it about you. I want to make your life better. I want you to be in a space that you can tell yourself, you know what, I am sick of this way of life or I'm sick of this person treating me this way or I'm sick of not being enough or I'm sick of the fear that I'm living with and I want to make a change. I want to make a big change. I want to take a leap into something better, something bigger, something stronger and I want to be that person. I want to be that person. And if you want to make it about yourself, go for it. And if you want to make it about others, go for it. Whatever fulfills you, whatever path that you want to lay out before you and just travel it and see what happens so that you can learn, so that you can fall, so that you can get back up and dust yourself off and figure out what the next right step is for you. Because when you reach that age, we can leave the nest and you don't have to listen to your parents anymore. And then you're going to do things that maybe your parents don't like or maybe your peers don't like or maybe other people think is crazy. And what are you going to do that for? That's stupid. You're going to go meditate in the woods for a while. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Well, you may have to prove it to yourself that it's either the best thing that you could have done or the worst thing that you could have done. But either way, you will gain the experience to take the next right step for you. And then you'll know what the next right step is. And sometimes that's what it takes. Sometimes you do have to take the wrong steps first to take the right steps next. And the person who wrote this email, you're 19. You are young, and you're probably going to hear that over and over again. You're so young. you got your whole life ahead of you. I'm not trying to say that, although it's true. All I'm trying to say is that because you're 19, your mind hasn't grasped quite everything yet. It hasn't figured everything out yet. It was fed a lot of programming. So you have to remember that the way you think right now was probably very heavily influenced from others. And being in religion, it can be very influential as well. Sometimes good, sometimes not so good, depending on how you feel about yourself, how you feel about your life, how you feel about the journey that you're on, and on and on. So you just have to understand that Right now, you might be going through some deprogramming, and that's okay. You might be going through this existential crisis, like you said, and you have to figure out what your next step is. And it's okay to not know what your next step is, because sometimes you never figure it out, and sometimes the journey is all about learning what that next step is. But never settle for small. And what I mean by that is don't be small. Be larger than yourself. Outgrow who you are. Find out what serves you. Find out what you benefit from. Find out what makes you feel good inside. And that might be a very philosophical, spiritual thing. But do what you can for you. And you will outgrow yourself. You will figure this out. Thank you to this person who wrote the email. And thank you for joining me today. I hope this has been helpful. 
I appreciate you tuning in to this bonus episode. I want to remind you to go to neurohacker.com. And when you're checking out, make sure to use the promo code TOB to get 15% off your first month. Plus, when you shop today, you're going to get 50% off the first month anyway. So that's another 50% on top of the 15% with the sale code uh, TOB. Thanks again for joining me. You are amazing. Talk to you soon. Thank you.